Hello everyone, my name is Gitika Gorthy and today I'm very excited and honored to be interviewing a very special space champion, Miss Frances Poppy Northcutt. Mrs. Northcutt was born in Louisiana and grew up in Texas, studying mathematics at the University of Texas. She calculated the return to Earth trajectories for Apollo 8, the first mission to leave Earth's orbit and circle the moon. Additionally, Miss Northcutt helped retrieve the Apollo 13 astronauts after their mid-flight disaster and she worked on every other mission to the moon in between. Miss Northcutt started her work with NASA as a computerist, like many other women at the time in the space agency. But unlike most women of her day, she advanced to become a member of the technical team and ended up in mission control. After her time with Apollo, she earned her law degree and became a women's rights advocate, and she remains a champion of women's rights to this day. I'm so excited to be able to understand her journey on a deeper level. So welcome, Ms. Northcutt. Thank you so much for taking your time to inspire the next generation. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's good to see you. Yeah, before we get into understanding like what led you to get into the space industry, could you tell us more about your typical day? What do you currently do and how does it run? Well, I'm semi-retired now, so uh, it's hard to predict a, a typical day. Uh, I still do some legal work uh, for, I'm a, I'm a referral lawyer for an organization called James Due Process, which uh, provides legal assistance to pregnant teenage girls. So uh, I'm sort of on call. So I, I never know exactly when I'm gonna be called to uh, go in and help a girl. And these days, because reproductive rights are under severe attack in Texas, um, when I get a call to help a girl, I have to immediately do it. I mean, it's sort of like an Apollo 13 every day, okay? Every day is like a disaster and you're trying to uh, just make it through. Yeah, it's amazing how like you're able to really continue to give back to the community. When I read about your work and how you consider yourself like a one-time rocket scientist, but a lifelong women's advocate, I was extremely inspired. Um, and so I'm a little bit curious on your childhood. So growing up in Texas as a young girl, how did you become interested in mathematics? Well, I can't say I really was fascinated by mathematics. I mean, people have a tendency to think, oh, you must have had this lifelong thing. I enjoyed the subject and I was pretty good at it. I had a good aptitude in it. Uh, I went to a, uh, I had some sort of uh, National Science Foundation thing for high schoolers that I got to go to some summer program. But it was really about the, you know, that I had an aptitude for it. It wasn't that I was looking at it as a lifelong passion. And so did you like always uh, know that you wanted to like major into mathematics or was that just a choice you took because you were good at it? Well, it was more of the latter. And actually you have to understand the, the landscape in which women lived at that time. I'm 78 years old. So uh, at that time, the, the options for women that were you know, out there offered to you were extremely limited. If you were going to college, the expectation was that you were really going there to, to get a degree that's called an MRS, okay? You were looking for a husband. You weren't really going there to pursue a career. And to the extent that you were gonna have a career and you had a college degree, the, you, know, you were siloed and st stereotyped into being a nurse, being a teacher, or maybe an executive secretary. And that was pretty much the world that was there for women at the time. Um, so I had expected I would be a teacher. Yeah, and, and did you, and how did that change? Like, how did you end up working at like a technical firm after and getting into the space mission? Well, I, uh, I finished college. I had a degree in mathematics and I had taken a course in celestial mechanics, not because I was fascinated by the subject. A lot of my life has been governed by just things that happen along the way. I primarily took the course because I needed another math elective and I didn't want an eight o'clock class, okay? 
Understandable. But, um, <laughs> I, I had taken the course. Uh, it was interesting, but I, I still wasn't fascinated by the subject, but I started looking for a job. Uh, it was, I graduated mid-year, um, not really the time that she would go into teaching. I'm looking for a job and uh, I, you know, find out about a job with a contractor at NASA for a computerist, which I thought was very strange. I had taken some computer science stuff, um, but I wasn't really looking at being a programmer. Anyway, uh, I was offered this job. It sounded pretty interesting. It was, there were a contractor at NASA. So I became a computerist. And did you, you know, when I was reading how you were like the first woman to work as part of the technical staff, and these days, you know, when I hear of different girls that are in their physics classroom and they end up being the only girl, they end up facing like imposter syndrome or have had people come telling me they dropped out because they felt isolated. Did you ever have the imposter syndrome when you were working with all those males at the time? Well, I came there in a different, in a, a different way, first of all. You have to understand that, you know, coming in as a computerist, I was not, I was in a female stereotypical job. Mm -hmm. And it was while I was a computerist, actually about three months into the job, that, you know, the light bulb went off in my head, uh, looking around, you know, these guys that I'm working with that, you know, I'm as smart as they are, but they sure are earning a lot more money than I am. Um, you know, I could do what they're doing. Um, so by the time I was in that position, I had already decided I belonged there. Yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly, is that the reason what inspired you to fight for women's rights and women's advocacy? Was it knowing that there is this disparity in, you know, equal pay, even if they have the exact same talent? It, it was, okay, it really was, because it's, it's like I had a short course in sex discrimination. We didn't have women's study programs in college at the time. Uh, there was no talk. I had never even heard the word feminism before. I guess I knew about the suffragists, you know, but um, I'm, I'm just in this environment and seeing all of these things. And at the same time, in the external world, in the greater world, uh, the second wave of feminism was occurring with Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem. And uh, I was aware of that through the news. And uh, once I was in as the first woman in mission control, I had a lot of press attention and I would be asked about women's rights by the press. And that also spurred my feeling that, well, I need to know what the hell I'm talking about, okay? okay? So, you know, I would look more into the subject. But I was very aware uh, when I was a computerist, for example, about the way protective legislation discriminated against women. Because uh, in Texas, and it was common throughout the United States, they had these wage hour laws that limited the amount of really overtime that you could get if you were female. They didn't have comparable limits on the amount of overtime that men could get. And of course, overtime is premium pay. It's time and a half. Um, in Texas, it was a 954 law. Uh, nine hours a day, maximum 54 hours a week, okay? Now I was working on a project, the Return to Earth project was um, very intense. It required a lot of work and the team worked really long hours. They worked, we worked Saturdays, we worked Sundays, we worked nights, I mean, we worked a lot. And my supervisor would come by and say things like, you know, he'd come by at like six o'clock and say, Papa, you know, we can't pay you for more than nine hours a day. Uh, <laughs> so I was aware of that. And, and, you know, I didn't pay any attention to that. 
I just stayed anyway. I would say I know and I'd keep on working. But I understood immediately that it had a big effect in terms of how much money I could earn. But the other effect that it had, I think, was even more severe, not just in the paycheck that I would get that week or that month. But those kind of laws actually limit the opportunities of women. Um, if you were an employer, who would you want to hire if you had a crunch kind of business? Would you want to hire people that could work the whole crunch? Or would you want, or would you say, oh, well, no, you know, you know, this worker is going to leave at nine hours, even though I really need somebody to stay here for 10 or 11 hours. So the real impact of that was in limiting the promotion and opportunities for women. And, and I was very aware of that. I think instinctively I was aware of that. Yeah, it's so like, thank you for shedding light on that. I think sometimes, you know, as a young student, student myself who hasn't seen that and back then, you know, 40, 30 years ago, what was happening, it's amazing to see how much progress we have made in terms of equal pay, even though there's so much more that we can do, we are in a much better state than we were a few decades ago. So thank you for shedding light on that. Yeah, well, I mean, at that time, women were earning about 53 cents on the dollar as compared to men. Wow. And do you think that there are still certain things to this day that you're trying to work and advocate for, like certain things you'd like to share with us? Well, sure. I mean, women are still uh, experiencing unequal pay. Uh, they're still earning about, you know, 78, 79 cents on the dollar on average. And you have to understand that women of color, especially Black and Hispanic women, are I mean, that's the average and they're earning far less, okay? Uh, so there's still big disparities in terms of pay. And also uh, the American Association of University Women does studies on this equal pay issue very every year and they're really good studies. And what they have found is that when women graduate from college, women who come out with comparable degrees, comparable everything to males, that within a year after them being out, they will be about $5,000 a year behind in their pay. So, you know, it, it happens immediately and then it just gets worse because once you have the disparity, it widens because your promotion, your, your pay raises, okay, typically are like a percentage of your existing salary in big companies. So they may say, oh, well, you know, the max is 8%. Well, if your 8% of your, of that other number is lower than the male, that means you're just gonna get more behind. The other thing that happens is that when you go from one job to another job and they wanna know your previous pay, Again, they're gonna make their offer based on what you got before. And if you were already discriminated against, it's just gonna carry forward. So one of the legislative proposals that's been made and that exists in some places uh, is to prohibit employers from asking about your pay at your previous job. Uh, the other proposal uh, that some are following is that you should know what everybody's getting paid. So that way, you know, if you're being discriminated against. I think that those are amazing. You know, actually, there was a similar conversation that we were having in my own county in Virginia, where the teachers, their male teachers were earning more than female teachers just because there were less of them, but they were teaching the exact same subject. So it was really crazy when I, as a student myself, was hearing that. And it's to this day, it exists. So it's definitely mind blowing that we're in that mm -hmm. time, you know? And what advice, you know, something that you said that really stuck out, stood out to me was how you said you knew that you belonged when you were working with all those males because you realized you had the same capability as them. So what advice would you give for other young girls out there who sometimes might feel like less than someone else, even though they have the exact same capability? What advice would you give? Well, uh, jokingly, one time on Twitter, I said, you know, people ask me about mentors and I said, you know, I don't have a mentor, but I, I have had a life coach 
and my life coach is Miss Piggy. Uh, and, and, and I'm not only half joking when I say that. Uh, you know, Miss Piggy never has imposter syndrome. Think about that. Miss Piggy is a pig <laughs> and she does not have imposter syndrome. Okay. She knows who she is and she knows what she wants. So she doesn't get stereotyped. I mean, you know, she just goes for it. And uh, I, I think that's good life advice. I mean, you know, just go for it. I mean, you know, don't let other people define you and don't let other people narrow your options. Definitely. Just like believe in you who you are. And I think that's a great example. I haven't actually heard that one before, but it's actually a great way to think about it. Just know, like, know who you are. And, you know, I, I'm like also, you know, going a little bit into your journey. Did you have some twists and turns in your journey that kind of led you to who you are today? Like, how were you able to overcome the challenges that you faced? Well, I think, first of all, I don't focus on things being obstacles. Uh, I mean, some people think an obstacle is a stop sign. I just think it's a challenge. And, you know, so you figure out a way to go over it, under it, around it, or through it. Uh, you don't just look at it and say, oh, and give up. Yeah. And were there any certain moments for you when you were maybe working at NASA or even afterwards where you had to kind of redirect kind of where you were going or was, did you, were you able to overcome the challenges that you did have? Well, the, the main thing was that we lost our major contract at NASA and uh, I transferred out to California where TRW's main headquarters were and uh, was working on anti-ballistic missile weapon systems, on defense systems, and I really did not like it, okay? Uh, that just was not something I wanted to do. Uh, you know, the, the technical problem is interesting, but having worked in the space program, which is a very aspirational kind of thing to do, uh, in the space program, every day, you're looking forward to your work being used. You know, you, you, you can hardly wait for it to fly, okay? When you're working on something like the anti-ballistic missile weapons system, that is your worst nightmare if what you work on has, is ever used. A whole different kind of mindset. So I hated that. And, uh, so I came back to Houston. We still didn't really have, I mean, we didn't have the kind of contracts that we had and uh, the space program was winding down. So I had to confront the fact that, you know, what am I going to do? Am I going to uh, maybe try to do something where I'm working on shuttle? Am I going to try to do something which, you know, having worked on going lunar and we had already done some preliminary work on Mars missions the idea of working on Earth orbit just did not turn me on. Um, was I going to work on interplanetary? That had a little more appeal, uh, but un uncrewed missions. Or was I going to do what I had increasingly become interested in doing, which was to work on women's rights? So uh, I ended up going to law school. Did you, did you ever like have doubt that at that age you weren't, you, you couldn't like, cause you already had a career. Would, were you nervous or scared to take that step? I was not nervous or scared. I mean, look, I mean, you know, I was in my forties, but I was going to be in my forties, you know, whether I had a law degree or not. So, you know, you just go forward. Yeah. And yeah, that's, that's an amazing way to put it. And I know a lot of times people always are like, oh, once you're like 20 years old, you have to figure out everything that you're going to do. Or when you're in high school, you need to know your career. But I think what your story really shows is like a testament that you could change your paths at any time you'd like. Absolutely. And, and people should keep be open to, to new opportunities and new ideas. You know, in the, in the world, you know, two, 300 years ago, that idea that you were going to be a whatever 
and that was going to be it for the rest of your life was pretty much true. Of course, the lifespan was awfully short too. And there, there wasn't really travel and there wasn't really communication and there, there weren't all of these resources. But today we're in a very rapidly changing world. Uh, you know, in my lifetime, I've seen, you know, us go from never having been even orbited the earth, much less go anywhere, uh, to now, you know, we have things, we have ingenuity flying around a little helicopter on Mars, okay? <laughs> and we have communication systems that none of us dreamed about uh, that are ordinary for you. I mean, you know, you, you probably have always had cell phones, but you know, the idea of walking around with a phone in your pocket, that comes, you know, that was an idea that was sort of in the comic strip Dick Tracy, uh, where they had, you know, wrist uh, watches that, that were actually communication devices. But, you know, there's amazing changes that are going on, and there's going to continue to be amazing changes that go on. So if you're not prepared to move, uh, with the change, you're going to be left behind. Yeah. And, you know, the, what, what you were saying really kind of stuck out also with, I was reading a little bit about Elon Musk's and like his reason for inspiration for the launch that he's conducting. And he was saying how he wants to make science fiction, not fiction. And I thought that was really powerful because it shows that we're trying to move in like at a rapid pace. I mean, from 10 years ago to 10 years now, and imagine the 10 years after this in like 2030, 2040, how much technology is going to advance and how we need to keep up with it. The skills need to change. The workforce needs to move faster. So I, I definitely see the constant rapid change. And yeah, I definitely agree with that perspective. And so I noticed also on social media, you're also an active participant in like encouraging girls to be a part of like Brooke Owens Fellowship and various internship opportunities. Do you have a place that you suggest for maybe undergraduate or graduate student uh, girls to get involved more in job opportunities at a younger age? Well, I'm, and those, I mean, the Brooke Owens is just super uh, and they have a wonderful program. Uh, you know, there's lots of... Uh, there's some clubs uh, that are involved in spaceflight in particular that are, that are really good that they can get involved in. In terms of work opportunities, even, even like NASA even has some high school internships, I think. Yeah, I was actually an intern this summer, so that, it was a great experience, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, if you're interested in that kind of thing, I mean, look around, there's, especially with the web, you can find all sorts of things on the web that you had no idea about unless you start looking for them. I'm always finding things on the web that I didn't know and I went go, oh, wow, that looks good. That looks interesting. I was on uh, the web this morning looking at, at some uh, uh, articles about legal technology and uh, thought, oh, wow, I hadn't heard about that. I got to download this and read this. Yeah, I, I remember like if I would search up, um, you know, like space camps or space summer programs for high school students, I would get like so many results and I'd open like 50 tabs. And I know there's definitely a lot of opportunities and utilizing the technology right in front of us is sometimes the best way to find these opportunities. So I definitely think we overlook that sometimes. Well, and they also have some ambassador programs, I think they call them. Uh, where you can be an ambassador for the space, space uh, program. Uh, I, I think the space program in particular has a lot of appeal uh, for young people, a lot of appeal just for crazy old people too, like me, uh, just because it, it, it is inviting you to imagine a new and different and better future. But also I would encourage people to not forget to be civically engaged. Uh, what is, you know, the school you go to, uh, the space program, almost any high technology field that you go into is going to live or die based on government money and government priorities. So if you're not concerned about your government's priorities, then you, you, know, you don't have a seat at the table. 
so you know if you if you want to have a viable space program for example you need to make sure that the government is supporting it even with uh spacex and blue origin and you know these uh private companies going into space they are still flying a whole lot of time based on money from the federal government uh, and they can't really get off the ground really too much without that federal support and the same thing is true in other other industries as well medical research all kinds of scientific research if you keep dig down what you'll see is there's a federal dollar there that is helping that exist so you know i encourage people you know become involved politically in your community uh, if you want people to take science seriously and during this pandemic especially i mean uh, it's like there's been almost a war on science if you want people to take science seriously you need to be at the table and you need to be speaking out uh, so that involves more than just voting uh, yes you need to register to vote yes you need to vote yes you need to register other young people to vote and try to get them out but you also need uh, to get to that table and have a voice there where the decisions are being made. And there's ways to do that. Yeah, whether it be formal or informal methods, like the formal being the voting or the informal with, you know, trying to get in involved in social media or signing petitions or being a part of certain rallies that are happening, just being active in your community and aware instead of being in a bubble, I think is also really important. It's not just STEM, but when you think of policy, it covers everything in your daily life from morning to night. And it's so important to, you know, advocate for yourself and for others. So, you know, definitely, combining STEM too with that is very important. Well, and think of all of the immediate things that it affects. Minimum wage, and if you're a student, that's probably what you're earning is yeah. minimum wage. Uh, it affects the wage and hours. It affects the safety conditions where you work. Safety is now a big concern. People may not have thought about it five years ago, but with a pandemic, safety is a really big concern. Uh, so, you know, do you have health care? When I was a young person, I didn't worry about having health care. I thought I was superwoman. I didn't need health care, you know, nothing, nothing's going to happen to me. And I think all young people sort of have that idea that they're bulletproof. But um, the numbers that are coming out, uh, I check the, the hospitalizations and so forth uh, every day about what's happening with this virus. This young people are being really much more adversely affected than they were in the beginning of this pandemic and uh, you know they're working a lot of times at frontline jobs uh, usually minimum wage jobs as checkers at grocery stores at you know fast food places places where they're exposed to a lot of people <laughs> that means a lot of exposure to this virus and you know what are the medical benefits at their employer? Uh, what are the medical benefits that the that their state is supporting? Uh, and you know, the government, if if they get sick, what's going to happen? So they need a voice in this. First, and I think sometimes I think uh, you know when you look at those voting rates of you know the younger generations compared to the older population, you do see that those who are just eighteen to like twenty five don't vote as much compared to the rest of the population, which is what really scared me. Think of it because that's a big population right there that are kind of ignoring what's happening around them. And you know your point really shows that they're they're impacted directly by all of this, and they do need to take it, you know voice their concerns because if they're not, they're just ignoring their own their own life. So I definitely agree with that. Well, and remember, I mean, you know, if you have the people who are at the table talking are the people who are going to be listened to. So if you're not there and are, you know, being part of the conversation, you're going to be on the menu. You're not going to, you know, <laughs> you're not going to be having being served your benefits. You're going to, you know, it, it's very important that you get involved. Of course. And, you know, now that we are able to like understand a little bit about your journey, as well as some of the women's advocacy work you do, you have given a lot of advice for younger generations to not only, you know, believe in themselves, but get involved um, 
you know, to advocate for themselves, politically be active. What is like one final piece of advice you'd give for young girls, um, you know, when pursuing a passion in the STEM industry, uh, you know, look, not only just STEM in general, but maybe any career, because I know a lot of the times we, you know, see these people and we're like, whoa, they're so cool. They must have been born with like a talent to be so smart. I mean, I wish I could be like that. And so sometimes we kind of oversee that they're just like us. So what advice would you give like that you wish you knew? Well, I think the main thing to always try to do is to keep an open mind about things. Okay. Don't, don't rule out. Don't think you don't like something when you haven't even really tried it. And, and that goes for whether, you know, you're talking about the books you read. Oh, well, you know, I don't read those. Well, maybe you should read a few of those and see, you might find out you actually like that. Uh, you know, so give yourself the opportunity to have new experiences and to see new things and meet new people. Don't just shut yourself off by stereotyping yourself, okay? Uh, there, you know, you'll miss a lot of opportunity if you do that. You'll also miss making a lot of friends that if you do that, you'll miss finding out a lot of interesting things if you do that. So, you know, just try to keep a very open mind about what you're interested in. Yeah, always keeping an open mind. Don't put yourself in this glass. You know, I know a lot of the times we're working towards breaking the glass that women have in any industry. And I think not putting that box over yourself or that glass over your own self and just being really open-minded is always very important. So I want to thank you so much, Mrs. Northcutt, for taking your time to share your journey with us, as well as giving important advice of what we should be mindful of. Um, I really appreciate it. As a student myself, I was extremely inspired and it was on very honoring to talk with you. So thank Thank you so much for your time. Happy to do it. It was great to meet you.